Hello all and welcome to Riverbank Christian Church. It's great to see you all here. It is such a blessing to be able to look out at so many faces. Um, welcome to church and I'd like to especially welcome any new people here. Uh, we are keen to get to know you. Uh, my name is Jacob and I'll be leading us through the first part of this service and then Reuben will be preaching on Philippians later on. Uh, if you need the toilet during your time here, then you can find those by heading out to the back of the auditorium, then head right out one set of doors and then left down the hallway. We also have a cry room available where you will still hear everything that is happening out here. Um, there is also a creche running at the moment for infants. These can both be found through the first doors on the left at the back of the auditorium. There is no Sunday school as it is school holidays, so our faithful leaders are taking a break at the moment. Um, however, there are some clipboards at the back which you can make use of for your kids at any time. If you have any other questions, don't hesitate to find one of the people in a black Riverbank shirt or hoodie and who you will have met at the door on your way in. Why are we all here at church? You might have your reasons. They might be vastly different to the reasons of the person next to you. You may not have thought about it this morning. Another question to ask is, what is God's reason for us to be here this morning? He actually gives us a reason through Paul in Colossians 3. Chapter 3, verse 16 and 17 say, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom and as you sing psalms, hymns and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. God's reason for us to be here is to teach and admonish or caution each other. We all have valuable insights from the Bible, and I would encourage you to not be afraid to share them with one another. His other reason is that we sing with gratitude in our hearts to God. Why, you might ask? Well, he explains that a little earlier in the chapter. There's a whole list of reasons, in fact. Let me paraphrase. We are God's chosen people. We are holy and dearly loved. We are forgiven. We are raised with Christ and hidden with Christ in God. How amazing is that? These are, not just, some of the, these are just some of the reasons why we can sing with gratitude in our hearts. I know this is not easy to do. I more often than not sing without thinking about what I'm saying. But maybe this time we can all dwell on the lyrics a bit. Let me pray before we do so. Dear Lord, you are gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. You are righteous in all your ways and loving towards all you have made. Thank you for all this. We pray that we would remember it new every day. We pray that you would bless this morning's service and that we would all be refreshed and emboldened to share our faith with one another and our communities. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now let us stand and sing with thankfulness.
So I just want to flesh out this passage in Colossians 3 a little more um, that we read earlier. There is a lot in there that we can apply right here and right now. Verse 15 makes it very clear that Paul is talking to all the people of the church, not just the leadership or anything like that. He is talking to all the people when he goes on to call everyone to teach and admonish each other. In fact, the speaking of the word in wisdom is in the same category as singing, and we've all just done that, haven't we? So how do I do that? I don't feel well equipped to teach anyone. Everyone else seems to know so much more than me. These can be very compelling points. But if attending a growth group and leading our youth group has taught me anything, it's that 10 people can read the same passage and hear the same sermon and get vastly different things out of it. And that listening to your peers is an excellent way to learn. So I would encourage you to have those conversations. Do as Paul says and dwell on the word of Christ then use that to encourage each other in conversation. Say you attend a Tuesday night growth group. Why don't you call one of the other members on a Wednesday morning and continue the conversation from last night? On the drive home from church, parents, ask your younger kids what story they learned in Sunday school or ask them how, and ask them how that could impact them. All of us, even if you're not a parent, ask the youth of our church what they thought about the service. Talk about a Bible verse you've been reading at home that inspired you or challenged you. Youth, ask your parents about the sermon if you didn't understand something or just to get a different perspective, maybe. Share some wins and losses from your outreach attempts. I always feel very awkward doing this, um, but I love it when others do, so that's a barrier that I need to personally need to work on. If you have a regular catch-up for coffee or dinner or something else during the week with somebody, one time when setting up the get-together, set a Bible verse as one of the things you plan to talk about. If you're at school with people you know go to church, you could set aside a lunchtime to open the Bible with them. Tell of some of the joys or sorrows of following Jesus. During the sermon, you might think of a question or find something really interesting or perhaps not agree with something. Write it down on the notes on your phone or on the back of your hand or just remember it. Talk to your best friend about it afterwards. Talk, about, talk to someone you've never met before about it. We all have the ability to discuss these things. Let me read a few more verses from Colossians. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness and patience. Bear with each other and forgive any grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you, and over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. So maybe these sorts of conversations don't come easily to you. I think we're all in that boat to some degree. But we should not shy away from them, as it is on us all to receive each other with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, and love. If we all do that, then these conversations will become easier. And the point of doing this is to grow together as the children of God. We're all in this together, so we should lift each other up in conversation. And one thing that is especially important is to apply this to your children as well. It may be painful to ask how the sermon was and just receive a good in return. I know I've given that answer more often than not, but it is always worthwhile. Um, so keep persisting with it. One day you may get a deeper response. It's time for the kids' talk now. Uh, so I would like to invite Ronnie Geskis up for that. And afterwards is the kids' song. Then the band will lead us in how deep the Father's love for us. So please stand after the kids' song. Thanks, Ronnie. Hello, boys and girls. Come and join me at the front. There's plenty of room today. I think perhaps some of us are away while we're on school holidays. But come and join us. Come and join me. Great to see you. 
All right. Well, who's on school holidays at the moment? They're good, aren't they? Yeah, we like that. I like school holidays too. Um, all right, so today I wanted to start, before I start talking to you about the Bible, to do something a little bit of fun. Um, do any of you know how to pull a silly face? Can you show me your best silly face? Ready? I'll do one, two. You ready? One, two, three. Oh, look around. Okay, pull your funny face and look around. Look at the funny faces. Can you see? Oh, there's a good one over there. Excellent. All right. Today we're talking about faces that we pull, but not just silly faces. Sometimes our faces can show us how we're feeling inside. All right. So, um, I want you to imagine something for me. Imagine there's a toy that you really, really want. Maybe you've been asking mum or dad for this particular toy. And then one day, it's not your birthday, it's not Christmas, there's no reason at all, but your mum or your dad just buys you this present, this toy that you've been really wanting. How would you feel? Good? Happy? Can you show me a happy face? One, two, three, go. Happy face. Yay. That's pretty good. All right, let's try something else. Let's imagine we're going to the beach and we're going to do all your favourite things on the beach. We're going to play. Maybe it's cricket or go fishing or collecting seashells or if it's not too cold, we could even get into the water and have a swim and a play. But just before we get in the car to go, a storm comes along. And it's raining and pouring and we're not going to the beach anymore. How would you feel about that? Oh, sad. Show me your sad faces. Oh, not good. Not good. Let's try one more. Let's imagine you're away with your family in a faraway place that you've never been to before. You're visiting. And then you lose your family and you're on your own in a place that you don't know, you are lost. How would you feel if you were lost? Worried, there's a nice worried face. Worried, yeah, Ooh, not good, is it? Not good. All right, our faces can show lots of things about how we feel, can't they? But today I want to wonder about someone in the Bible and how they might be feeling. The person from the Bible is the Apostle Paul. And I'm going to show you a picture on the big screen, if you could have a look. Can you see that? If you might need to move if you can't quite see. That's, the, that's a cartoon picture of the Apostle Paul. Now, where is he? Have a good look at the picture. Where could he be? In, in jail. That's right, he's in jail. Mm. How would he be feeling, do you think, if he's in jail? Sad, yeah. Could he be cold? Yeah, maybe. Might he be hungry? He might be hungry. Absolutely, he might be hungry. He could be in pain because those jailers, they were pretty rough people. They didn't always treat you very nice, so he could be in pain. He might be worried and scared. Now, Paul was in jail for doing something that he loved to do. Paul loved to tell others all about Jesus. And some people didn't like what Paul was doing and they put him in jail for it. And he had been in jail for two years. Now, last year I was in lockdown at home, not in jail, in lockdown for a few weeks. That drove me crazy. But Paul's been in prison for years. I don't think that would feel very good, do you? No, not at all. So let's have a think. What would Paul be thinking about and how would he be feeling while he's in jail? Well, we can know a little bit about what Paul's thinking because he wrote down lots of things while he was in jail. He had time to write letters to people and, and many of those letters have ended up in our Bible and so we can read what Paul wrote. Let's have a look at what he wrote from 
um, from the Bible in the next picture. Oh, can somebody read that? Does somebody want to write it? Read it? Can you want to read it? Do you want to read it in the microphone? Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Well done. Thank you. You read that beautifully. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say again, rejoice. What? Paul was in prison. He was sad. He was lonely. He was hungry. He was hurt. He was scared. And he's saying, be joyful. That doesn't make any sense at all, does it? Why would Paul say that while he's sitting there in prison? You know, there's a clue in that verse. What does Paul say to rejoice in? What should we rejoice in? The Lord. The Lord. You see, Paul trusted in an almighty God. He loved Jesus. He believed that Jesus died on the cross for him, paid for his sins and was risen in and in heaven and that God loved him very, very much. And the thing is that even though Paul had those feelings, because I don't think for one minute he wasn't sad or hungry or worried, but Paul's love for God was bigger than that worry. Paul's trust in God was greater. He didn't let those feelings overwhelm him. And so he could still be joyful He could still rejoice even though he was in that horrible place. I wonder if we can be joyful. We're not in jail. We've got lots of good things to be happy for. But even in the times when you feel a bit sad and a bit low, you can still trust in your God and you can still praise him. And I've got a job for you to do, boys and girls, today. What I want you to do is to share your joy with someone else today. There's someone that you know that sometimes needs a joy reminder, someone very close to you, your mum and your dad, they sometimes need reminders for joy and I wonder if you can go and do that today sometime. What I want you to do is go to your mum or go to your dad and give them a big hug. Can you do that? Yeah? And when you give them a big hug, I want you to say this. Rejoice in the Lord always, mum. Or rejoice in the Lord always, dad. Because we can encourage one another to be joyful. Let's try and remember to do that, yeah? So give them a joy reminder. We're going to rejoice in the Lord right now. We're going to praise God because our God is great. We're going to sing a song called 1098 God is Great. There's not many children in the front this morning. So congregation, can you join us this morning? Can we all stand up and sing together 1098 God is Great? Help me with your clapping hands and your counting today, guys, okay?
Please take a seat. So today's offering is for Focus, a uni-based uh, ministry in Hobart. Uh, the head of Focus, Luke Hansard, is here uh, with us this morning. So I'd like to invite him up uh, to explain a little bit more of what Focus does. He'll do a much better job than I can. So you can either give electronically via the details on the screen behind me, or there is a cash box at the back of the auditorium. Luke, welcome to Riverbank. Thank you. Tell us about Focus. Can I move this? Yes, do that. <laughs> Morning. I've come to you with my son, Josiah. Give us a wave, Josiah. From wet, cold Hobart to sunny, warm Launceston. How often does that happen? But it, it's like, it's like travelling to a tropical country. Travelled all that way, but so happy to be here with you because I want to want to thank you from the bottom of my heart and from the bottom of Focus's heart for your partnership in the ministry um, for many years now. It's so good to have you with us as we get the good news of Jesus out to... Well, we've got two groups happening during the week out to the South Asians. That's India, Nepal, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka. Um, I've missed one there. But uh, so we've got the... The South Asians and the East Asians, that's mostly from mainland China. So we've got those two groups going on. You're partnering with me in getting the gospel to these people who have never heard the gospel before and in the case of the, the Chinese group, never have an opportunity usually to hear the gospel. Um, I'm really happy to report to you that it's been a fruitful year, even though we're still kind of, well, the, the borders are, are shut, even though we, we feel that the, uh, the world has been locked out. Actually, they're also locked in. They're, they're still here. There's a lot of people from a lot of different places that are stuck here in Australia um, with us. And even we're finding that p people are moving from Sydney, well, up until recently, Sydney and Melbourne down to Hobart. So we've still kind of got an international student, new students coming onto our campuses um, due to these guys moving from the mainland down to here. So, so good things are still going on. By God's grace, we've seen a bunch of people turn to the Lord Jesus. Really thankful to, to see God save Vivian and Stephen and Yo-Yo and even Prince from India. Most recently, there was a guy called Luke who turned to Jesus. Uh, he came to me, I think, three weeks ago on a Friday night and said, Hey, I've become a Christian. Can I serve Focus now? And I said, Yes, so let's meet up next week. And uh, we talked together about how he might... Uh, now, having been fished, become a fisher of men with us in the Focus Ministry. I'm also happy to report to you that we have a second apprentice who's starting with us next year, uh, a young lady who has come through the ministry and is now keen to serve with us for some years. She's fluent in Mandarin, Japanese and Malay and, of course, English. So she'll be a great blessing to us. It also looks like we'll be sending a few missionaries over the next couple of years. Uh, we'll have one person, God willing, heading off to China and another person, God willing, heading off to Malaysia. So it's been a fruitful last 12 months. I'm thankful for your partnership in it. Uh, your investment is producing some amazing eternal results. And if you'd like to know more about these results, I'll be around after the church meeting to talk to. Uh, if you'd like to personally partner with the ministry, whether it be through prayer or, or some other way, again, come and talk to me. Or you can talk to any of your leaders and they can certainly put you in touch with me and the Focus Ministry. Thank you. Thanks, Luke, for coming up and cheering with us. Always good to hear about the ministry uh, happening down there. Now, as many of you would know, uh, our vision, part of our Vision 2030 document and plan is to plant a church uh, in the future. Uh, and now this is going to be a big task. Uh, it's going to take time, effort, energy um, and be a sacrifice for all of us. Uh, not just for this is not just for our church council, for our leaders, for our staff, or for those who are going to be a part of that plan. That's a part of. It's going to be for all of us, uh, both those who go, those who stay. Uh, 
will have to bear that cost and that sacrifice. Um, and so as we start this process, and we're certainly only just starting it now, um, it's important that we're all thinking about this. Um, and so coming up uh, at the end of the month, uh, is a Vision 100 church planting conference. So the same group who organised Challenge Conference is uh, planning a church planting conference with some of us uh, already heading along. So the date is October the 27th. Uh, now there's an event in Hobart, but there's also going to be a live stream from Devonport uh, at Pathway to Life. And so we're going to head along to the live stream. Uh, in Devonport and so it starts at four o'clock um, and I'm aware that that will be mean that it's difficult for many of us to make it along um, but if you are able to come with us please let myself or Reuben know we'll be carpooling down um, but also if you're interested in heading maybe later um, the second session will start at 5 30 um, let us know we'll see if we can organize a carpool to head down to that but we want to start thinking about church planning and this is a fantastic opportunity for us to begin that process. So please consider if you can make it along um, and get in contact with myself or Ruben. Thanks. Thanks Luke and thanks Jed. Um, I also have a few announcements. There's quite a number today. Um, so the National Youth Convention that I've been promoting uh, earlier this year has been postponed until January 2023. Uh, so if you're one of the few people involved with that and you have some questions, then come chat to me afterwards or have a look at their Facebook page. They've released a video about that uh, due to COVID, of course. Um, the Tasmanian Youth Convention, or TYC, is on this coming weekend. So a crew from our youth group uh, will be heading down to Bishino for that. It would be great if the whole congregation could keep us in their prayers. Um, that it will be a great time of spiritual growth for the youth and fellowship as well with the rest of the state. Uh, Reuben is speaking at it, so remember him in your prayers as well. Um, Michael, and, Michael Worthington and Chloe Gibbons are set to be married this Saturday, which is incredibly exciting. Uh, so remember to pray for them as they go about their final preparations. Unfortunately, due to COVID again, they cannot have an open invite to everyone, but I urge everyone to join them by praying for them and encouraging them on their big day. Um, it's Link Cafe tonight at 5pm, one of our outreach events. Jed will be speaking at that, Jed who was just up here. Uh, so come along and think of people you can invite to it as well. Um, don't forget there are business card style promos for it on Andrew's desk at the back. It might make it a little bit easier if you have one of those to invite someone. Uh, Lord willing, next Sunday morning we'll be holding Lord's Supper. Uh, this means that all people intending to join should prepare themselves accordingly. As Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11, everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink of the cup. Let these questions guide you in your examination. Do I believe that my sins are forgiven only because my Lord sacrificed himself for me on the cross? Is it my sincere desire to love God and my neighbour and to serve them according to God's word? If you answer yes to these questions, then you are invited by the Lord to come joyfully to his table. If not, then we encourage you to repent and seek Jesus' forgiveness before considering coming to the table. morning's Bible reading is from Philippians 4, the first nine verses. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, you whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, dear friends. I plead with Euodia and I plead with Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you, my true companion, Help these women, since they have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel, along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers, whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. 
Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard of from me or seen in me, put it into practice and the God of peace will be with you. Thanks, Anne-Marie. Good morning, Riverbank. It's lovely to see you all again. If you don't know me, my name's Reuben. Uh, it's my privilege to open up this passage with you now. And I want to begin by asking you a question. <clears throat> How does it feel to be a Christian? Now, if you're not a Christian this morning, welcome. We're so glad you're with us. Uh, it's a question that maybe you can think about too. How do you think it would feel to be a Christian? Now, I'm not asking, what do Christians believe? We've been talking about that a lot in our series through the book of Philippians. We've been talking about how Christians believe in Jesus Christ, that He's our life and our death and our, our identity and our future. We've been talking about how we believe that we are citizens of heaven and that even when opposition and persecution come, we are safe and secure. We believe that there is important work to be done for the gospel. Throughout Philippians, Paul has just been urging us, go all in for Jesus, live a life worthy of the gospel of Christ, he says. And he's been calling Riverbank to pour ourselves into the work of, of Vision 2030, to being a loving and united church that reaches out to Launceston and the nations with the amazing life-saving news of Jesus. That's what we believe. But this morning, I want to come at that from a different angle and ask, well, how should that, how does that make us feel? How should the Christian life feel? What, what emotions go along with it? You know, it might sound inspiring and grand and glorious to speak of living for the gospel, honoring the King with our lives, but, but if you're anything like me, the Christian life often feels far from inspirational. It often feels more like a limping struggle, doesn't it? Kids, maybe you know, um, you know that game, Snakes and Ladders. Sometimes in Christian life, we feel like we take a couple of steps forward, maybe we catch a little ladder and things are going pretty well, and then this dirty great big snake comes along and you just slide all the way back down almost to the beginning. Maybe it's a tragedy and it fills your life all of a sudden with grief and sorrow. Or it's a struggle with a sin that just seems impossible and so discouraging. Maybe it's a sense of, of burden and pressure, just constantly living in this world that seems to bombard you with bad news again and again. Maybe it's a feeling of frustration and disillusionment because the church isn't what it should be. And you wish that this or that ministry could be improved or this or that person who hurt you would acknowledge their sin. If you can relate to that, I want to show you something interesting. As we look closely at our passage this morning, if you haven't opened a Bible, it's Philippians chapter 4, we discover that Paul was actually writing this letter to snakes and ladder Christians like us. In verse 2, he talks about broken relationships and conflict in the church. In verse 4, he talks about joy, surely because he knows how easily we tend towards complaining and bitterness and discouragement and despair. In verse 6, he talks about anxiety, because he knows how often even Christians are crippled by worry and, and burden and weariness. And then in verse 8, he talks about the pressure of living in this cluttered world, bombarding us with information and entertainment. You could, you could fill your mind and your time with endless things. So much of it is alluring and yet so much of it is unhelpful. And these are the real life situations and struggles that we live in as Christians, aren't they? 
we don't live out our faith on some shiny new playground that you saw advertised in the brochure of the new suburb that's going in down the road. No, we live out our faith on a playground that was built decades ago in the dodgy part of town. And the swing, it's rusty and it creaks. And the slide is dirty. There's something on there that you don't want to look at. And the playground, the, the sandpit, it's really just a patch of dirt now. That's, that's where we live out our faith as Christians. So with all of that in mind, how do you think it feels to be a Christian? We might be tempted to say, oh, it's difficult. It's tiring. It's discouraged. It's, it's disappointing. Striving for the gospel, building a church, shining like stars in this dark world, like Paul says, more like barely surviving. Well, look with me at verse 4. With all of those struggles in mind, look at what Paul says. This is an incredible command. We've looked at it already this morning. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. You, you can't get any more emphatic than that, can you? And then in verse 7, he talks about our hearts being guarded by peace And then in verse 9, he talks about the God of peace being with us. How does the Christian life feel? Well, God says, Christian, I want your life to jump with joy. I want your life to pulse with peace. We see these words, joy and peace, come up again and again and again in the Bible, describing the Christian life. Joy and peace. Joy and peace. God is saying to us this morning, I saved you to live a life that oozes with joy and peace. You can live a life like that. (laughs) How can God say that? Uh, Does he have any idea what it's like to live in this crazy world? Uh, He does, actually, because he's been here, hasn't he? Jesus Christ, the Son of God, has lived in our bitter, broken, burdened world. He didn't just vacation here, book a couple of nights at the silo. No, He was born here in a cattle trough. He lived here, He died here through murder on a cross, under the wrath of God in our place to save us. And now He's risen again and He's ascended to heaven. He's seen what it looks like on the other side of death. And that is the God who says to us, there is a way to live in this fallen world with joy and peace. Yes, even in the midst of pain and struggle, there is a way to be always rejoicing. God isn't ignorant of how hard it is to be a Christian on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday with crying babies and nagging bosses and depression and panic attacks and problems at home and struggles at church and a Bible that seems hard to read and a phone that glows so enticingly. God understands all of that. And yet He promises us that bit by bit, more and more, it is possible to experience deeper joy. How? (laughs) Well, we want to think a little bit more about that now. Because in Philippians 4, verses 1 to 9, Paul shows us three things that can steal our joy and peace. And in each case, he shows us a better way. So first, we're going to look at broken relationships. Then we're going to look at burdened hearts. And then thirdly, we're going to look at bombarded minds. So let's look at these three things together. The first thing that can steal our joy and peace is broken relationships. Take a look at verse 2. There are these two women in the church, Yodia and Sintashe, maybe, I don't know how you say that, and they've fallen out. They've had a disagreement. We don't know why, maybe it was over the best way to do church or a matter of theology or something personal, but we do know that Paul takes this really seriously because he he calls it out publicly and and he even names them. Have you ever experienced a conflict or or a tension in a relationship with someone here at church? If you you have, you'll know how that tension starts to kind of cloud your vision. 
And it's almost all you can see and think about is that person sitting over there and what they've done to us, maybe how annoying they are. And, and it festers like an infected wound. I mean, it might seem minor, but it quickly steals your joy and it poisons the unity of the church. Unity's been a big theme in the letter of Philippians. In chapter 2, verse 2, Paul called us to be like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. And now, he's taking that theory and he's applying it to a specific example. Euodia and Sintashe, I plead with you, sort it out, be of the same mind. So let's go past the theory to specific examples and situations. Is there a specific broken relationship that you need to address? A buried hurt, a festering grudge, a person who you just avoid on purpose. I plead with you, stop waiting for it to go away or for the other person to act first and sort it out. How? How do we do that? If, if broken relationships steal our joy and peace, how does Jesus restore joy and peace to us? Well, the world says, if people steal your joy, just cut them out of your life. You're better off without them. But Jesus shows us a better way. He shows us that the way of joy is to fight for reconciliation and unity, even with people who aren't naturally like us. How is it possible? It's there in verse 2. Be of the same mind in the Lord. He reminds Yodi and Sintashi everything they have in common in the Lord. They're Paul's colleagues, they're co-workers for the gospel, they're fellow leaders in the church, they have their names written in the same book of life, you're going to be in heaven together forever. Their unity isn't built on being the same age and liking the same music, it is their shared identity as Christians and their shared goal of living for the gospel. And notice Paul doesn't take sides, he, he treats them equally, he assigns a mediator to help them, did you notice that? In verse 3, he talks about my true companion. We don't know who that is, but it's someone close to Paul, maybe on his ministry team, who he says, help, help these ladies out. And Paul is asking for more than just don't argue. Look at his example in verse 1. Look at his affection. My brothers and sisters, you whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, my dear friends... What type of relationships are you creating at Riverbank? Dear friends or mere acquaintances? When someone rubs you up the wrong way, do you actively avoid or actively love? Because one way leads to bitterness, the other way leads to joy. You say, well, actually, the broken relationship I'm thinking of isn't in the church. This person's not a Christian, so not really sure how we're going to be of one mind in the Lord. Well, take a, take a look at verse 5. Paul says, let your gentleness be evident to all. What is this gentleness? Well, it's a word that kind of means not retaliating as expected, not insisting on everything, being kind when persecuted, yielding even if they're in the wrong, forgiving even when they hurt you, which doesn't come naturally to us as humans, does it? It's something that we have to learn from Christ. Remember chapter 2, the one who made himself nothing and became a servant and humbled himself even to the point of death for us. Joyful Christians are gentle to everyone, not because they're pushovers, but because they've been shown a better way. They've experienced the joy of God's forgiving love. Okay, that is joy thief number one, broken relationships. But now, in verse 6, Paul shows us a second thing. Our joy and peace can be stolen by burdened hearts. 
Look at how verse 6 begins. Do not be anxious about anything. I love that that is in the Bible. God knows us so well, doesn't He? How many of us are prone to worry and stress and lying awake at night with our heads spinning? Prone to feeling burdened by our problems, by our futures, by a fear of dying, by our children's struggles, by relationship stuff and church stuff and work stuff. Prone to feel like it all rests on my shoulders and I'm basically here just doing it on my own. Half the time, we don't even realize our hearts are burdened, but the people around us see us becoming more irritable and bitter and withdrawn. How does Jesus restore joy and peace to our burdened hearts? It's so simple. He, he invites us to pray. When? In every situation. How? By presenting all our requests to God with thanksgiving. I read a poem this week. Said the robin to the sparrow, I should really like to know why these anxious beings rush about and worry so. Said the sparrow to the robin, uh, Friend, I think that it must be that they have no heavenly father such as cares for you and me. Theologian Norman Harrison once said, The world worries and has ample reason for doing so. It faces tremendous problems with no real solutions to them. How sad is that? But for those who trust in Jesus, Paul says there isn't a single thing you need to worry about. Why? It's there in verse 5. The Lord is near. He's near. Jesus didn't stand at a distance. He jumped into the mud pit with us and He understands our fears and He cares about our worries. And through Him we can bring everything to our Heavenly Father whose ears are eternally open, whose hands are continually active, whose power is infinitely great. And then in verse 7 we come to one of the most precious promises in the Bible that when we pray and we cast all our burdens on Him and we remember to give thanks for all the blessings we have from Him, the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, enters our hearts and minds and guards us. God's peace guards us, like Arnold Schwarzenegger, perhaps, standing outside the door of our hearts with a machine gun, shooting down every fear and worry that threatens to come near. O oh, weary one, have you prayed? Do you carry all your burdens to your friend in heaven and dump them at his feet? Soon in Tasmania, there's going to be an exchange program where you can take an empty bottle to a depot and they'll give you 10 cents for it. The heaven exchange program is way more incredible. Give God all your problems and He will give you all His peace. He will recycle your worries into wonders, your burdens into blessings and your problems into peace. Okay, so far we've looked at broken relationships and we've looked at burdened hearts. Now finally, the third thing that can steal our joy and peace is a bombarded mind. Young people... You know what a bombarded mind feels like, don't you? Netflix never runs out of suggestions. Your Instagram feed is eternal. Snapchat never stops pinging. TikTok will entertain you with relentless intensity and determination. You could consume content non-stop forever as long as your phone battery didn't die or your body didn't shut down from overstimulation and sleep deprivation. Life in the technological age is a bombardment of content. And it causes Christians to react in different ways. Some of us, we look at a world like that and we see a bin full of rubbish. This is the Christian who rejects the world as evil. We would rather rent a desert cave on Airbnb and retreat 
away from it all. Then there are other Christians who look at the world and they don't see a rubbish bin, they see a pot full of gold. This is the Christian who sees the world as this alluring array of delicious delicacies and they dive in head first. Here's the thing, both these approaches deprive us of deeper joy. Take the one who sees the world as a rubbish bin. They're failing to see that the world was made by a good and loving God. And they forfeit joy because they feel oppressed and attacked by the world and they fail to see that there is beauty and truth and joy, not just in Scripture, but in so many other God-given things like literature and movies and music and food and art and sport, and you could go on. But on the flip side, the one who sees the world as a pot of gold, they're failing to realise that our good world has been poisoned and damaged by sin. And as they fill their mind with unfiltered content, they consume not just good, but evil too. It's kind of like guzzling Tic Tacs, without realising that half of those little white things aren't actually mints, they're actually human teeth. They start calling good things evil, they start calling evil things good, and over time, God just becomes more and more boring. And their prayer lives shrivel up, and their interest in spiritual things is gobbled up by the glitter explosion of the here and now. Okay, how does Jesus restore joy and peace to our minds? Read it with me, it's verse 8. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, Think about such things. This is the alternative way to view the world. It is the better way that leads to deeper joy. We filter the world through the lens of Christ to know what's true and what's not, to know what's pure and what's not, what's lovely and what's not. If, for example, we learn to enjoy and celebrate sex even as we resist the pressure to accept every sexual practice, is good. Or, or we enjoy good books and movies and TV shows, but we also think carefully about the quality and the quantity of our consumption. And, and you know, that list could just go on and on and on. How is this possible? Because we make God and we make His Word our compass. And it says there in verse 9 that, we follow the wisdom of Paul's teaching and his example of how he lived. So, how are you going with this? Could it be that your joy is being stolen because you've believed the lie that everything in the world is evil and worthless and just out to get you? Or could it be that your joy is being stolen because your mind is polluted and numbed by a barrage of things that are untrue and impure and unlovely? Could it be that you have been setting your mind on earthly things and not things above? There we go. Three things that threaten to steal our joy and peace. Broken relationships, burdened hearts, and bombarded minds. Would you like to live an unhappy life? Would you like to be bitter and resentful? Would you like to be overwhelmed and burdened? Would you like a shriveled, dry faith where God seems boring and irrelevant? Well, if you follow these three simple steps, you can have the unhappy life of your dreams. First, hold grudges against other people. Focus on your differences. Always insist that you're right. Only go to church if you want to, and when you're there, only talk to the people who you really like. Second, 
feed your worries and fears by meditating on everything that could possibly go wrong. Tell yourself that you're all alone in this world and that everything rests on your own shoulders. And third, fill your mind with everything and anything that the world throws at you. Don't think too much about whether it's true or helpful. Feed every lust and desire that pops into your head. Don't worry about reading the Bible or paying attention while you're at church or ever really soaking or meditating on Jesus and what He's done for you. And you can have the unhappy life of your dreams. Or you could choose a better way, a way of deeper joy. And it's summed up in these amazing words, rejoice in the Lord always. How does it feel to be a Christian? Paul says, it can feel surprisingly peaceful strangely joyful, mysteriously calm, even when the circumstances of our lives tell us we should be bitter and anxious and depressed. Like a tree that sways in the storm but never snaps or breaks because of how deeply its roots are planted. You and I can grow deeper roots in our own lives when we realize that we are in the Lord, always. Your life, your identity, your future is hidden and secure in the Lord if you trust in Jesus. And so, this is Paul's refrain, you can stand firm in the Lord, verse 1. You can be of one mind in the Lord, verse 2. You can rejoice in the Lord, always, verse 4. You can rejoice in the Lord that even in the midst of hurting and strained relationships, the Lord loves you. Our names are written in His book of life. Rejoice that Jesus has shown us how to have loving, forgiving, healing relationships. Rejoice that as Christians, we can be united at the deepest level. We can talk about more than just footy. We can pray for each other. We can spur each other on when life gets hard. Rejoice in the Lord that in the midst of worries and pressures, the Lord is near. Rejoice that the one who controls the universe bends to hear your prayers. And so we can bring all our requests to Him with thanksgiving, thankful that our Heavenly Father cares for us and promises to work all things for good. Rejoice in the Lord as you enjoy every good thing from His hand. Rejoice as you meditate on the spiritual blessings that are yours in Christ. Fill your mind with the excellencies of Christ, His love, the hope of heaven. But also, rejoice as you enjoy God's good world and His good gifts. I'm not saying this morning that Christians experience joy and peace all the time. You know that's not true. But this is what God calls us to decide on and to fight for, that we would rejoice in the Lord always. That is what God wants, intends to pour into our lives, and one day that is what we will experience perfectly, completely, eternally, continually, forever, inexpressible joy and peace. Let's pray now. Let's pray together. Lord God, we thank you for this this refrain that just keeps cropping up in Paul's writing, in the Lord. We thank you that we are in the Lord, that we are in you, that you are with us right now, that as I pray, as we pray together, you hear us, you're listening. We thank you that because of your Son, who is next to you right now in heaven, interceding for us. You hear our prayers and you answer them. We thank you that there is healing to be found for all those relationships in our lives that are hurting and broken. We thank you that there is relief 
and peace for all those times that we feel overwhelmed and anxious. We thank you that there is good and truth and beauty in amidst this world that is so fallen and sinful. And so, God, we we pray this morning that you would lead us into deeper joy and deeper peace, not looking for it in our circumstances, not shopping for it online, but finding it in the Lord as we lift our eyes and realize just how unbelievably blessed and safe and secure and loved we are in you. We pray all these things in the name of the Lord. Amen. The band's going to come up, and then we're going to stand up, and we're going to sing kingdom song. We're going to sing about the peace and the joy that we have in Jesus. I'll invite you to stand. Thank you very much, Reuben. Definitely needed that myself, and I'm sure many others did as well. Um, And thank you, everyone else, that made today happen. It is such a blessing uh, that we can have a service like this every week. Uh, A reminder that it is Link Cafe tonight at 5 p.m. here, and that the offering is for focus. Luke will be hanging around at the front uh, if you have any more questions for him about that ministry. Um, Reuben and I will also be at the front. If you have any questions, or wanted to chat to us about anything in the service, or if you wanted prayer for anything, we will be there. Um, There will be some... Sorry. But I would also encourage you all to talk to each other about the sermon, uh, or anything to do with your faith afterwards. There will be some questions up on the screen after the last song. So if you want to start a conversation, then those might be a great lead-in. Be encouraged by these words in Joshua. Be strong and courageous, do not be afraid, do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Let us sing our last song.